Welcome to the Got Academy podcast. This podcast has been in the works for some time and we're kicking things off with Got Academy collaborator, novelist, English literature professor, writing professor, Theo Ganji. This specific series of episodes we're gonna call Marvelous. We're gonna talk about Marvel movies, starting out with Thanos, the hero's journey in the Infinity War. During the season, every Sunday, we're gonna post a new episode to this podcast. We're gonna have history in movies and science in movies, both with Dr. Ruth Hervos. We're gonna have social justice in movies with some new contributors, and we're gonna have so much more. So if you're catching this on YouTube, check out our podcast either on iTunes, on Stitcher, or on Spotify to never miss any episode. So let's kick things off with Thanos, the hero's journey. A villain going through a hero's journey? Mm. This is definitely unorthodox, and especially in superhero movies. Mm. Take a listen. Hello, everybody. Hello, Theo Ganji. Hello, Gil. How are you? How are you doing? I'm excellent. Oh, you beat me to the punch. You asked how I was before I got to ask how you were. This is a groundbreaking event in God Academy. Holy sh... Man, I broke the rules already. No, no, in a good way. I think this is just like... This is so symbolic to what mm. we're doing now. Because this is the first podcast in the got academy podcast the first podcast episode and already we're changing everything <laughs> because y you matter too gil people need to ask you how you are doing even my mother doesn't ask me how i'm doing was that too dark too quick uh well i don't know i, I mean i don't know your relationship with your mother um yeah let's uh, let's talk about it later maybe But let's start. Okay, so people are tuning in now to the Code Academy podcast. And our first podcast episode is about Thanos after we watched him in the Infinity War. Ooh, very soon the Endgame Marvel will come out. But now we want to talk about Thanos in Infinity War. So, so generally speaking, we were talking about it uh, off the air the popular idea of the hero's journey call to adventure then refuse the call and then you have a mentor and you go through and this is just like uh, like the matrix basically uh, something very generic but you were telling me that this formula is actually more complex uh, than this and it doesn't have to have all the stages in order to be the hero's journey and thus You don't have to, ref if you don't refuse the call, if Thanos doesn't refuse the call, but quite the opposite, doesn't mean that it doesn't fit. Right, exactly. It's the broad strokes of the hero's journey are where it's relevant. When you try to make it fit like, you know, like some kind of very rigid structure, of course not every hero story is going to involve a refusal and a mentor. That would be super, super boring. Uh, the idea uh, behind a hero's journey in the way that It's either relevant, helpful for writers, helpful for people thinking about why they connect to stories the way that they do, is in the idea of this transformation of consciousness, uh, also known in writer terms as a character arc. Right. So what was his arc, Thanos' arc, in the movie? Yeah, well, I mean, he comes, when he comes in, obviously, he's, he's in the middle of the action already, right? So, right, which was interesting, even, yeah. It's an interesting way to start a movie. Which was, I think, a very smart choice. I mean, part of the part of the reason I think the Russos decided to make this movie around Thanos' arc is that there were too many hero characters for it to make sense mm -hmm. any other way. You know, uh, you couldn't structure it solely around Iron Man or Star-Lord or Gamora. Or any. It's it, it making it around Thanos' journey was, I think, the only way this a story with whatever a dozen main characters could actually hold up and be coherent. Right. right. Um, so when we meet him, he's, he's already, he's already gotten the first stone. We basically see him in flex, right? He arrives, he hands the Hulk's ass to him. Right. 
which is just like to tell us uh, okay this guy is serious this is serious this is right. not like the right. previous guys exactly this is this is them demonstrating his power and value and creating the threat uh, of Thanos to the world if he can just without the use of the stones you know right just, just like hand to hand <laughs> kick the Hulk's ass um, and then he has like a He needs to take a pill or something uh, later, uh, the Hulk, because he can't uh, Hulk it up anymore. I don't know. He needs some therapy or something. He's just like, uh, he really like broke his heart. You could see yeah, that he, he's he didn't he's want like to come back. He's traumatized. Yeah, yeah, Hulk's yeah. Hulk's got like PTSD. A, uh, for me, it sounded like a, I don't know, bad, like a really bad sexual experience that now he just like, <laughs> he can't, uh, he can't be green anymore. Just like, I don't know. He needs to to find somebody that uh, I don't know will help him feel again like a hawk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe a fatter exactly. villain, somebody to bring uh, to bring back his uh, his confidence. Yeah. Yeah, some you know some uh, somebody just to you know stroke his ego a little bit maybe, you know. <laughs> so he kicks the Hulk's ass. Yes. And and he kills remorselessly. He kills Loki. Uh, he kills Heimdall. He says it has an interesting line. No resurrections this time, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Which, for any comic book fan, it's kind of like, yeah, okay. Uh, you know, the genre, um, it's not like so much the tension around will you kill a character. It's how long will a character stay dead in comics. <laughs> um, so it's not like Game of Thrones. Even though it's there not was like one Game character that came back there. Yeah, true. Yeah. A couple and I didn't like that part. Came back. A couple of guys, right? And I didn't like the Lady Stoneheart, but whatever. We're not going to talk. This There is going to be no Game of Thrones on this podcast. No, actually, there could be some. Yeah, maybe, a little, <laughs> maybe a little. Maybe a little. Only a little, though. Well, well Jon Snow <laughs> absolutely came back to life, but whatever. Um, right. <laughs> Right, and that was so, also the thing. When will he come back? That was just the only, the only question. Infinity War, for many reasons, was like a groundbreaking Marvel movie. They've been at it for like ten, eleven years. It it could have got old. It really could have got old. They could have kept making the same movie. They they would have kept making money. Uh, but mm-hmm. something got in them with the Russo brothers. Uh, the Russo brothers, the directors of Infinity War, for those who don't know, also directed. Captain America uh, Civil War, a.k.a. Captain America, is kind of actually an Iron Man movie. And they directed uh, the Captain America Winter Soldier, which kind of solidified their bona fides. As, you know, because before then, they directed shows of Arrested Development. And, and That's so weird. Like, yeah, it's a, it's a strange leap. So already they're unlikely directors of, of big Hollywood movies. You know, movies. The biggest. There is nothing bigger in Hollywood. I think it's a testament to Kevin Feige, the, the, the kind of, he's the godfather of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that he took a chance on these guys and keeps kind of taking chances on new ideas. Sometimes they work out, like, you know, with Ragnarok and, and the Thor movie. Sometimes, you know, uh, like Iron Man 3 didn't work out so good with Shane Black um, as a director. But, you know, they're taking chances. Which is great. Yeah, that's not usually the way Hollywood does uh, blockbuster movies. Right. Here, the, the chance that they took, if I get what you're referring to, is basically that the protagonist is the evil dude. Yeah, yeah I think you could say that. Yeah. The villain. You know, protagonist is a tricky term. I think as far as, you know, what we're used to seeing from a structure of a film, that it's laid out in what's often referred to as a hero's journey. Uh, Joseph Campbell was a scholar, right, who came up with this this sort of sequence of heroic deeds that he found in a distillation of mythological stories and texts from all over the world, from all over different cultures, different times. He came up with this hero's sequence that um, he found a kind of consistency and different challenges and archetypes that the hero would encounter through their travels, through their adventuring, right? That kind of like retrofitted to Hollywood screenwriting. And they said, oh, like Hero's Journey is just like kind of what every Hollywood movie is organized around. So the interesting thing with Avengers uh, Infinity War is the Hero's Journey 
is not Iron Man's hero's journey. It's not Captain America's. Captain America barely has any lines in the movie. He knows a guy. Uh, he's got cell phone problems, I guess. It's the hero's journey is structured around the villain character of Thanos. Okay, so so if I get you correctly, so when we're talking about about the hero's journey, yes, basically what Joseph Campbell did is he took all kinds of uh, iconic stories from all kinds of culture. And when he analyzed them, broke them down, he realized that there are common themes, human themes in mythological and communal and social stories that humans have been telling themselves about themselves and about their beliefs over long spans of time and geography and cultures. Yeah. And that basically speaks to something very human in the way that that we tell stories and share stories. Yes. And this is why this formula has been so successful, right? Because if it's something very primal in us before we, there was no internet. Right. There was nothing. We weren't maybe uh, yeah, writing like book reviews and stuff and, and, and posting videos. But still, there was something that was consistent in the way that we told stories when we we're talking about the main character of the story. What grade would you give me, Professor uh, Theo? Did I understand uh, the concept correctly? I would give you an A freaking plus plus, dude, because you just boom. nailed it. Yeah. Boom, boom. You boom, nailed it. Yeah. Boom. This um, is what I do. This is what I do. Patreon.com slash God Academy. <laughs> I think, you know, I think even, you know, sometimes, you know, when we, when we academize things, see what I did there? It, mm-hmm. it can it can make them feel a little removed from you know human experience or whatever people like to relate to when they sit down and watch a marvel film right uh, but the hero's journey i think is what's important about it or what i think is relevant about it for anybody is you know campbell really saw it as a way that people articulate the journey from one phase of life to the next phase of life right so okay you know, throughout life, we go through a lot of manifestations of identity, right? So, Gil, you know, you go from being a son, a brother, you become an independent man, you become a spouse, you become a father. An ex-spouse. <laughs> and you become an ex-spouse, exactly. Uh, in my case, soon-to-be father. All these identities that we sort of traverse through life... You know, we don't just snap our fingers one day and associate with a whole new role, a whole new stage, right? Mm -hmm. They, our psyche needs a little foreplay, (laughs) needs a little, a way to ease into and ultimately cohere and manifest this new identity. And, And so each role has a cycle, right? But, you know, you start out. Uh, with a certain set of expectations for yourself from the world, from people around you. And you're always kind of stepping into the unknown, right? And I think that's where this idea in the hero's journey of the unconscious kind of comes in. That, you know, when we're when you're doing a podcast for the first time, right? After being a YouTuber, mm-hmm. for example, right? This is a new identity. We're stepping into the unknown, right? and yeah totally yeah and so there's so there's new challenges and where the hero's journey comes in is the way the challenges start to present archetypes to us right so you know archetypes are like a singular version of an entity like a father figure a mother figure a brother it's sides of ourselves yeah yeah right so a lot of times in mythological stories, in superhero stories, in fantasy stories. They're very archetype-oriented, and that's kind of the language they're spoken in. So when you see a Gandalf character, this is an archetypal father figure, right? A Dumbledore uh, is a sort of version of that, right? Let's ground it for a second and and take all that and put it into into Thanos in Infinity War. First of all, he is a father. That's right. But... When, when you spoke now on, on, on the challenges and things that you go through from A to B, if we take the Thanos of the beginning of the movie, very cocky, very self-assured, doesn't uh, care, like he doesn't flinch when he kills uh, Loki, to the Thanos at the end of the movie, 
even though he succeeds in the goal that he set out to do, he's kind of a different person. You have my respect, Stark. When I'm done, half of humanity will still be alive. <coughs> I hope they remember you. He's not very uh, jolly and happy about fulfilling this, uh, this mission. Somehow, like the... All the process and the challenges that he went through and the sacrifices and losing whatever his entire army and friends and then having, of course, to sacrifice uh, his daughter and then fighting everyone. It seems that like the weight uh, of it all just dawned, of him, dawned on him. He wasn't uh, very happy about it or gleeful. Very different from the way it was at the beginning. You yeah, agree? yeah. His, 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 his vision as he articulated it, right, was that he would sit back and and smile upon a grateful universe. And when he got there, it didn't quite seem, seem, seem quite like that. Suggested by his journey, by his hero's journey, that there was sacrifices made that did take a toll on him, but that he ultimately did achieve this transformation of consciousness that is at the heart of the hero's journey. Yeah. That going from yeah. the, the cycle, which Campbell broke down into departure, fulfillment, and return departure fulfillment and return the interesting thing about this thanos quest is he is he is so ambitious that his journey is is in a sense to become a god to become someone with the power to wipe out half of all life right right is a godlike kind of ambition yeah which is kind of a callback to old mythology in a sense because of uh that theme of sort of achieving a kind of divinity was in a lot of the old stories and the flirtation of a mortal with divinity. So Thanos' Thanos's journey starts getting tricky when it starts getting personal, right? When his daughters uh, and his role as a father become tested. And that's where, at least for me, I started recognizing this story is, is you know, the knock on Marvel movies for a long time was the villains were just so underdeveloped and boring. Um, and the Russos took that to heart, boy. Uh, they said, all right, yeah, we're going yeah, yeah, yeah. to really develop this guy to really demonstrate, you know, the lengths that this guy is willing to go to prove that he's right. Um, and I think it's interesting. His pathology is interesting, right? Because we're never, and I think this is deliberate, we're never actually shown any resource issue in the universe, right? His solution about resources was directly related to right. some shit he was right about in the past, and now he's going to assert his dominance in true, in true daddy fashion, right? Titan was like most planets. Too many mouths, not enough to go around. And when we faced extinction, I offered a solution. Genocide. They called me a madman. And what I predicted came to pass. A few things about that. First of all, this is... We just like extrapolate. We here in the 21st century have a, a problem with resources and too many people. This is now going to be the reality mm -hmm. for the entire universe. This is very, very silly. It's like Ender's Game. Have you, you I assume you read the uh, Ender's Game? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there, the writer imagines a future with all kinds of like uh, insect uh, insect villains with their hive mind and everything but the geopolitics are still you have the warsaw pact and nato mm -hmm. even in the year like whatever to uh, 2100 because uh, the book was written during the cold war right it's very human to just like imagine that the reality that is now this is it's hard to imagine a, a very different reality in the future. Well, it's interesting, you know, this may be an aside, but about that book, he get, doesn't get credit for this, but he kind of called like the internet and anonymous bloggers in like the 70s. Like, I'm pretty sure it was like night. It was like in the 70s, he wrote that. And right. there was an anonymous blogger that right. was one of the turns out it was one of the kids who gets all this political influence on this network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's kind of crazy. Um, Twitter, that's basically Twitter. I mean, that, that guy was a nut for other reasons, but that was, that, he was pretty on point with that one. Um, he's like uh, anti-gay, which, uh, which is funny because he, he's like into understanding <laughs> alien insects, but not humans who uh, 
get a hard on from uh, the different kind of humans that you get a hard on. That's that's a bridge too far. The insects, I'm gonna go for the insects. Bridge too far. Bridge too far. Bridge too far. Yeah, no, there's a lot of head scratches out there. So Thanos. Okay, so so first of all, the resources. That's uh, that's kind of silly. And then, like you said, it's like. Uh, is that the only solution? Like they don't even discuss. Uh, maybe even the good guys, right? The Avengers. It's not like they're you know, proposing an argument uh, about uh, Mr. Thanos. Mr. Thanos. Maybe we can do it another way. We have uh, whatever the Green New Deal. The right. <laughs> no. The futuristic Green New Deal. No, he's not in the. Nobody. Nobody talks uh, policy. It's just like either kill half of the people to save everybody, right? Or don't. They don't pr- pr- propose anything else. They just say this is evil. What you want to do. But they don't dispute the necessity of it. Right. To, to view it in social terms, it's, it's the whole concept is totally absurd. I think is in mythological terms, it makes more sense. In psychological terms, it makes more sense. Okay, go ahead. Mythological terms. Yeah, like this, to me, this is about, this is about a man trying to become all, pro- all powerful to prove he's right. It's about domination. It's about one entity hell-bent on dominating the world before him uh, and going on a quest to achieve the power uh, so that vindication and domination right. can, can happen. And the fact, the fact that it's stones, which is something that has a mythological feel about it, it's not something, mm. uh, whatever, out of the realm of whatever, something in the faraway universe that you can't even understand, some energy, whatever. It's a stone, it's... it's it's, it, it could be just like any mythological story where somebody wants to compile the diff, different magical stones in order to become all powerful. It could have been written in ancient China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it has, it has some of those echoes around the fascination around, around gems that's probably been with in human consciousness, you know, since right. before we recognize civilization as a thing, right? That they're unworldly beautiful powerful status oriented about gems and rings or lords of rings right which uh is a whole nother kind of exactly you know it triggers something primal in in us right um also it's like uh the basic elements in our basic uh, psychic structures right that's also a little bit in these uh, in these stones Mm. the one the one way i think thanos's quest is interesting on a social level is that it's about almost it's about big data almost it's like Mm. too much data uh you know we're in the era of um you know our minds can't even process how much data goes into the internet in a single afternoon and the idea that he's coming along and he's saying we need to cut all this shit in half i feel like kind of speaks to something of the moment um something of the anxiety (laughs) of the moment but as far as his like psychological journey and the hero's, uh, you know, the hero's quest along the way, this is about him settling a score with the universe to show them he's he's in control, he's in charge of it. Right, because something happened when he was a kid. Right, he said, "If we don't kill half of the people, the other half, not me and my family, my peeps, the other half, then everybody's going to die, and then everybody died." Right, something of the sort. He was a kid. Something like that. Yeah, actually, in. I will just throw this out there. I don't know how canonical it is, but there's a there's a there's a novel about Thanos's backstory uh, that that Marvel put out, and it's actually not terrible. And <laughs> in it, high praise. They they, they t- yeah no it's, it's like I don't know it's 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 weird. I, you know I'm a I'm a novelist and and I love comic books, and sometimes I the the mediums don't always cross over. You know uh, this. It's it, it's tricky, I'll say that. But in that version, Thanos's original plan included him, uh, him dying. So he was willing to make the self sacrifice for it, at least in that version. But like I said, I don't know if it's canon. I don't know if that really applies to the Marvel Cinematic Thanos. Uh, that actually could be an interesting conclusion to his arc in Endgame if he ends up willing to sacrifice himself to prove he was right. Yeah. yeah, I would like that. But I think I, I think that the filmmakers, by very intentionally not including any resource issue in the universe, are clearly telling us this guy is marching to the beat of his own drum. This is not a solution to any problem. This is 
right? This is a solution to a non-problem. This is like a border right. wall. This is, you know, yeah. <laughs> right, um, like nobody's saying, right, we don't have enough water or what don't we have enough, I think. I think right. Yeah, there's nobody. Right, if we really felt like the universe was in danger of total extinction. Right. And so we had to make a bargain like Thanos is that would be right. give him a different sense right. of rationality. Right. In his mind, he was proven totally vindicated because all the planet of Titan was wiped out. I think this is about a, a guy with a messianic vision who believes himself a possessor of divine knowledge and intention and purpose that no one else has but him. Therefore, anything that he believes is 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 moral or correct must happen no matter what, even if it means killing half of all people, even if it means killing my own daughters and the only people that that I that I care about. Um, right. So this is very biblical. This is uh, uh, like yeah. uh, it's Hak uh, being told by this higher power inside his head that he has. Right. He has to kill his boy. Actually, it's the opposite. It's uh, it's Abraham who's uh, uh, who's told to to kill his Hak. But then at the end, they say, oh, no, 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 just kidding, just kidding, bro. I see that you, that you really mean it, so that's okay. But here, it's like, uh, no, he had, uh, he had this, uh, this idea in his head, and there was uh, no uh, deer in the Bible. In the Bible, it was a deer, and then he just like, uh, sacrificed the deer. But no, he had, here he had to really, really kill his daughter, and that was when, uh, when his character really took a very, very interesting turn that I felt that uh, we were comparing him to former uh, villain, uh, Marvel villains, who were just like happy to kill everybody. He felt like uh, he was killing uh, other people and uh, right. not out of enjoyment. Yeah. Um, so let's let's look at how it how it comes through in the sequence and how it how it fits in terms of this in terms of this journey idea. What I think is so smart about the hero's journey and that if you pay attention to your own life, you might you might feel something similar is that the the premise of it is that our psychological vulnerabilities will inevitably be triggered by whatever this journey step into the unknown is. Right. So, in other words, you're starting a new job, you're starting a new identity, uh, you're married for the first time, you're a new father and you think you have a clean slate. But what what life will always do is remind you about some unresolved shit <laughs> that, uh, you know, maybe from your past and maybe a manifestation just that re that that triggers something of the past. Right. So this idea that these that's why it's an archetypal language. You know, the idea being that, you know, if you got daddy issues one way or another and that could express, however, issues of authority issues yeah. issues of purposeness um or issues yeah. of intimacy you're going to this next stage of life and you are right. going to be challenged by that daddy issue right yeah 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 yeah. you can you can go and travel to the other side of the world like i met people on the other side of the world talking about their previous issues and it was just like you're going through the exact same thing here now in whatever the mountains of india it's the same Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's the same thing. Right. My my mother, you know, she was a she's a psychotherapist. She would always say what we don't resolve, we relive. Mm -hmm. Right. What we don't what we don't deal with from our past. We just reenact. Right, right, react, right. Not really right. reenact this idea that. So that's why in the hero's journey, why it hits such a chord is it because it, it it's it's that when you step out, when Luke steps out into the adventure, he encounters this father figure that he must overcome and that it's in it's in overcoming the father figure that he's able to actualize himself as the jedi right that he's able and it's not until he overcomes the father figure that he's truly a jedi right so this idea of when we're stepping out into our hero's journey if you know these these unresolved issues from our past holding us back that we must confront and if we want to have a successful transition of consciousness into the next stage we must resolve that issue right and in mythological language that's going to look like it might look like a lightsaber fight right it might look right. like yeah. uh, slaying a dragon right so like another right slaying a dragon great example of this uh 
uh, Siegfried and the dragon, Sigurd and the dragon. After he kills the dragon, right, he, he tastes its blood. And as soon as he tastes the blood, he hears the song of nature. He can speak another, he can speak a language. The birds start making sense to him and they start talking to him. And they start telling him things. They actually tell him to eat the dragon's heart, but whatever, that's <laughs> neither here nor there. The, 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 the idea is that we, we assimilate these things that we conquer and that become, they become part of us, they become part of our consciousness and identity, and they enable us to speak the language of the new role, you know? Um, yeah, so, so if we connect it, if we connect it to, to Thanos, so he's reenacting, he hasn't really processed well uh, what happened to his planet uh, where everybody died. So he now just like his whole purpose is for that not to happen again. What he hasn't thought of is in killing half of all people, that people that he loves might die. In uh, that his, his messianic solution has overlooked the chance of his own heart and feelings and his own humanity in this idea that he is above humanity, that he is like this, you know, this 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 force of logic um this dispassionate ju- judge what the confrontation with gomora is is it's making him confront his feelings as a father his feelings of love for gomora as a father which and failures as a father he wants to see that she really loves him he doesn't have to do it this is not part of the, the of the project but he wants to hear that she loves him to see her cry. Right. I think that speaks to that he still has an emotional investment in her. And that when he when he's saying that we're just going to dispassionately kill everybody, uh, he's clearly not thought that he might kill Gamora. And that in order to achieve his quest, he's confronted with the thing he's overlooked, which is that he does care for her. When his ultimate trial, his ultimate test, right, which that in the... The sort of the the bottom his 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 bottom as a uh, the belly of the whale, which is a way of a mythological kind of expression from Joseph Campbell. Yeah, Jonah. Um, the the darkest sort of womb like moment of of rebirth and transition. When he goes to Vormir, that's his belly of the whale. When he must decide how far he's willing to go with this is can he kill Gamora with his own hands in order to achieve his quest he's a new person after that after he tosses her off that that cliff and after he sheds tears for her and he realizes that he does love her he does love he's not a dispassionate robot uh and he's still willing to make this sacrifice of Gamora and of his own humanity in that sense to kill his own daughter in order to achieve it he he is reborn in a new level of purpose. So when he comes out of Vormir with that soul stone, he's sort of at the cusp of that transition. So this is where we, we come into the return phase, right? He's, he's reached the crisis at this peak and he's, he's, reborn now. he's reborn now. He'll never be the same after he's killed Gamora as he was before. His naivete is lost. Right. Um, and so now it's about bringing that purpose really to the Avengers, to the heroes, and kind of stamping out that last bit of resistance. Um, right. I thought also when he killed uh, Gamora, I thought that the part that they did very well is that it, the, it was a payoff to when he wanted to, you know, everybody's, this is like a fantasy, right? That you can hear whatever, you can see how your family will, uh, will react to your death, how your kids will be, will be sad. And that spoke to me to basically, if we just boil it down to, to the nitty gritty of it, that was just like insecurity. I know I fucked up as a, as a dad, but I want to hear, I want to see uh, that my daughter really loves me. I wasn't a horrible dad and then when he gets what he wants then afterwards when he has to kill her he just made it uh, more real uh, him crying right no that was the, that was clearly the the setup moment for that right where she does where she does kill him in the fantasy where with the that he manipulated with the reality stone and then when she weeps yeah he gets that satisfaction and that tips his hand that tips the yeah. hand to us the audience 
that he's emotionally invested yeah, 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 in Gamora. Yeah, yeah. But that's a um, and so that's a great setup. That's a dick yeah. move, dick move, making your daughter feel that uh, she killed you, and then just watching and say, "Ha ha, I'm not dead." No, come on, this is a douche, douchey move. Total dick move. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Below the belt, come on. I mean, I mean, throwing your daughter off a cliff. I can understand that. Is one thing. <laughs> I can. Get, I, I mean, <laughs> it sounds, it's it somehow feels more cruel <laughs> than just like uh, pushing on her, her off a magical cliff in a in another dimension. I don't know. Yeah, I feel I like that. Know. That's a series. Let's like, aren't those like internet videos people do where they're like, or like they'll like pretend they're like they're cheating on their spouse or something, and then they're like, ha ha, just kidding. You're on the internet. <gasps> no. You know, thinking you've been cheated. Yeah, no, it's like a, it's like a thing. I actually saw one the other day where the dude, the dude just kind of beat the hell out of the, the. I think these need to stop. It's what? Pretty awful. Uh, but it's like a thing. Yeah, because they're all like, I don't know, they're all like Thanos. I guess they want to see how, how upset, yeah, that you'd be. So I have the different uh, stages in the hero's journey. It starts with the status quo, and then famously call to adventure. After that, assistance that can be from all kinds of uh, different uh, characters and archetypes. Departure, then trials, approach, crisis, that's the midpoint. After that, the midpoint is uh, return, and then new life and resolution, and you go back. Right. You go back to the beginning. Like Vinzini said, if something happens, go back to the beginning. Right. This is a Princess Bride right. reference. Yeah, that's okay. When he's drunk at the at the inn, right? right I probably right, watched right. it uh, more times than you because I watched it with my daughter. Probably more uh, recently, but I definitely, when I was a kid, I watched that so many times. Like I could tell you, like I could probably do the sound effects of how of the swords hitting each other on those scenes. Like <laughs> really, <laughs> I really watched it. Um, the hero's journey, Thanos, the villain, going through this journey with his, which is a, a very interesting choice. Put a bow on it for us, uh, Theo. <laughs> put a book. Well, let's walk through it. So we had the, I'd say we, we encounter Thanos at the crossing the threshold stage where um, kills his first uh, main characters from the MCU universe. And he and he has this and he takes a stone. The tests, um, you know, the trials, the period of trials is something you see him confronting uh, Guardians of the Galaxy for the first time. We introduce his relationship with Gamora. Yeah, so Gamora, that's the crisis. The, the, the ultimate crisis, right? And rebirth, he now has uh, he now has another stone and he comes back to Titan to confront Doctor Strange and the Time Stone and Iron Man, which is a sort of reckoning with the forces of, of the world that he seeks to overthrow, in a sense. When he comes back to Earth, newly empowered... Uh, he is now master of time, right? Uh, he sets back the clock. He he rips the stone from Vision's head uh, quite brutally, um, and then barely survives Thor's Thor's uh, Stormbreaker, um, and then the snap, right? Which is the sort of Campbell has the phase of apotheosis, the sort of becoming a god essentially, where Thanos has achieved power beyond our imagination right yeah yeah i thought if uh, if i connected to what i said earlier about uh, taking his idea the super id and then that is not connected to not necessarily connected to reality and then put it into the world when the movie starts when they talk about the power that he will have if he gets all the stones he will be able to kill half the universe with a snap of his fingers, and it seemed as they were talk as if they were talking figuratively, that it's not necessarily that this is the way to do it. But then the idea became reality, and that was actually the weapon, literally snapping right. his fingers. So I thought that was uh, that was beautiful. That was ah, they, like the concept changed, became from an idea into something very simple and uh, tangible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the great call back to the comics where that's exactly what he does. He just snaps his finger and that's that, you know, and that does it. Okay, so Theo, Theo, let's wrap it up. That was our first podcast episode together. I want to call this section Marvelous for now. 
It was marvelous. It was, it was marvelous. marvelous. If you think it, if you think it was marvelous, give it a, star, a five star ratings. Tell your friends, maybe share it on your social media. Mm, you know, and uh, and our next collaboration together, Theo, on this podcast will be about Avengers Endgame. We want to talk about Captain America after we watch the movie where he might. Uh, no longer be with us and then we will be able to summarize uh, this character that we have followed for so many years so many years in the f- in the fulfillment of his arc Ooh, and i have already so much stuff about him that i want to talk about but we'll post that after we watch endgame either right after it comes out or the week after excellent so theo did you have a good time i had a blast it was marvelous marvelous okay so thank you everybody for listening in and uh, if you want to support Got Academy, you can go to patreon.com slash Got Academy. Thank you, patrons, for supporting the channel. Thank you, patrons. Thank you, patrons. And we'll see and hear you all next time. Bye, everybody. Peace.